All right. All right. Welcome <laughs> to another episode of Remembering Me, a soul healing podcast. I'm Candice Love. I'm your boy, Brick City Buddha, aka Docs. And who do we have with us today? We got the we got the ball in here. Another ball, another <laughs> Philly one in here, man. What up, Easy? <laughs> What's good? This is uh, just Mike the poet. Mm-hmm. And um, if y'all have been under a rock, uh, especially people of black and brown culture, of course, this podcast is for everybody. But of course, these are experiences coming from black and brown people who have a certain unique experience set um, that we do vocalize. So if you are under a rock, if you are in any of those uh, demographics, this man has been out here for pretty much since like 2012 in the public. I, for sure. 2012, and I was just telling him before we started, the first time I caught wind of him when I was still heavy on Facebook, he just told me I got to go ahead and like really focus on Facebook because it's still audience over there, which I'm realizing. Um, but when I was heavy on Facebook, I'm talking probably six years ago, uh, maybe even more, I caught wind of this brother, and I'm from the poetry scene, um, came up in the Saul Williams era, going to the New York and as a 13-year-old, stuff like that. So I always have had an affinity for words and people who can use them like you do. And I remember this brother, first time I seen somebody performing poetry with his socks on. First, first thing that caught me was like, yo, why you got his socks on, right? So I tap on the video. He got on his jean, jacket, suit or whatever, got the white, um, white tee. And the way he was delivering it, the way that room of women that I assumed at that time was pretty much all women, right? Mm -hmm. The way they was receiving it, like the, the cues that you was hitting within their soul that was making them react in ways where it went beyond, this is nice poetry, he's a fire lyricist or wordplay, it was actually touching pieces of their trauma, their For triggers, sure. in a way that was actually still healing. I never seen nothing like that. For sure. And coming from my era of poetry, you know, Darius Love Hall. Mm -hmm. If you was a young black poet, you, you wanted to be Darius Love Hall, right? He didn't have that ability, right? He, he may have learned that in a relationship with Nina, but on that stage, he was trying to connect on a mind level. I'm mm -hmm. trying to show you how dope of a poet I am. I had never seen a black man in your package still looking regular, able to do that. So my first uh, win that I caught of you was then and then to now be connected with you when we shared the stage yeah. together at God Talk. Shout out to the, to the bro, AJ. AJ. Um, we was able to share the stage together and I get to see you do it in real time and hadn't connected the dot. Like, hold up, this the same brother with the socks. Yes. And I should have known it because you was in your socks on stage. And of course, you destroyed it. We was talking, me and my wife was talking while you was performing, like your energy and how you perform. Um, I don't even know if, if quirkiness is a strong enough of a word, but it's a uniqueness yeah. that has the ability to open you up and make the audience as vulnerable as you're being. Yes. So it's no longer a matter of you giving poetry to us. Now we're just having a conversation. Yes. And you just happen to be rhyming these fire, fire A um, <laughs> syllables and metaphors and all that type of stuff. So to have you here now is an honor. We're definitely going to dig into a lot of your work. Um, but we right, also cool. want to take this to a conversation beyond what your new audience probably knows you for. Sure. From tonight's conversation, yes, you're the relationship guy, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about relationships when it comes to you. We want to go into that, but a little bit deeper than that. Let's do and it. we'll talk about that when we get to it. Baby, so you got excited. anything? Yeah, no, I don't have anything. I'm excited, too. I can't wait to see where the conversation goes. You got anything? You good? Yeah. All right, you ready? May the words of my mouth and the meditation mm -hmm. in my heart be acceptable. Absolutely. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Absolutely. All right, so we always have like a theme, whether it's a strict hard theme or a soft theme where we could bounce around. And reading up on you, like it's almost an artistic process now that we're interviewing people. Because yes. to a certain degree, I got to do my best to, we have to do our best to jump into your psyche, right? Yes. Um, from the outside in. So I, we realized as we was talking about you, talking about our approach, there has been a lot of grief at the core of your talent. Right. Sure. Um, even in how you started to write poetry, which we'll get to in a second, a lot of that. <laughs> Takes we are, one to know. We're very clear that it's one thing to talk about relationships because yes. you're a poet. Right. And that means I know your wordsmith with words. And I know it also gives you an opportunity to um, romanticize words. Mm -hmm. 
when it comes to grief, that's a place that is not always romanticized and the truth of what you feel has an opportunity Absolutely. to surface. And the purpose of our podcast is emotional healing. Yes. They're all things emotional mm-hmm. healing. And so grief is such a topic that the average person feel. I mean, we feel grief just from birth alone. That process is traumatic. Being here and not mm-hmm. really having concrete answers is traumatic to the ego. Absolutely. So everyone is experiencing and grief even if they're in the midst of their happiness mm. so when we uncovered that grief had a process in your journey sure. we were really excited to ask you about that and give you opportunity to go as deep as you can absolutely yes. Yes. so the, the themes for today is going to be the poetry of heartbreak yes um the second theme that we'll kind of get into and we just had an experience where we could share a little bit where uh conflict of course is part of heartbreak and you being a storyteller yeah. There's always a protagonist, antagonist, and some conflict in, in between that makes a story or poem interesting, right? Yes. So we're going to do how conflict heals, and then we're going to do how we, how you handle grief. Yes. Right? And we'll just bounce around with it. Um, so starting out, I read that your initial um, download to start even writing out your thoughts before maybe you even called it poetry was kind of from your mom, right? You had the experience where there was a breakup. With your yes. girlfriend at the time. You remember how yes. old you were at this time? Yes. Uh, let me do the math. I was mm-hmm. probably, it was 2011, so I'm guessing 27. 27, okay. Um, you attempted to take yes. your life. It's for 30 sure. Tylenol PMs. 30 ball. Right. <laughs> 30 15 ball. two packs. Wow. Extra strength. Gas station, 58th and Baltimore Avenue. Mm. Luke Oil. Mm. I still see the guy who actually sold them to me. Does he even know? that? that? Nah, he didn't okay. Know. So with that being said, before you even get to the point where your mom expresses maybe you should start writing out your thoughts, what was it about that particular relationship, about that experience that was so heartbreaking to take you to the degree where you may have possibly took your own life? Well, that was my first one. Mm. That was my first heartbreak in a romantic sense. Now I've had I've had other mm. heartbreaks before. Uh, I'm a product of a home uh, that was riddled with domestic violence, so to watch my mom be assaulted mm. was a heartbreak, and mm. then to watch my father leave was a heartbreak. But this this thing that that love that was over, you know, without a without a a reason, let's call it. Mm. I mean, it was just a, it was a cascade of events, you know, and uh, I don't want to say I took the easy way out. I took the way that a lot of people think about. Right. There's nothing easy about it. Um, and that's just where, that's just where my emotions took me that day. And uh, I mean, I just thank God for a second chance. Absolutely. <laughs> I Absolutely. Just thank God for second chances. And thank you for being transparent because I know a lot of sure. black men have had these experiences. I told wifey the same thing. Like, we got a lot of similarities because it wasn't a breakup. It was just so much back and forth war in my 13-year relationship that I always talk about where I got to the point where I took a bunch of pills as well. Yeah. Right? Um, call, I got scared, called my parents. They rushed home. The girlfriend at the time actually came to the house. Um, I didn't go through the, the psych stuff and stuff like that. But I had the same experience, and it was a long time before I was even able to be vocal about that. So for the black men that may frequent this podcast or may catch this, just understand you're not as alone or as abnormal or as weak as you may feel in these moments, because a lot of us is going through this, but a lot of us can't get to the healing because we don't talk about it. We don't say anything about it. So thank you for being transparent. thousand percent. So from that point... Um, I, I saw where your mom was like, over a girl? I think that was in the quotes of one of the things that I saw. Well, uh, sometimes I guess the way uh, the story gets told, it's a little bit of gotcha. confusion. So um, I had an uncle who uh, committed suicide mm. maybe six months prior to when I attempted and he was a long time uh, heroin addict. Okay. And uh, he had a family that loved him so much. And I think one of the hardest things about his disease was his his fan club that was rooting for him to get clean while he still suffered with his addiction. 
and it came to the point where he took his life because he just couldn't, you know, he was just tired of being an mm-hmm. addict at that point. And my mother um, was the one who found him. And then I remember she had called me that day and she says, hey, you know, Uncle Gabby's not answering the phone. Um, I went around his house and there's a bunch of flies in the window. Mm. Can you come here? Now at this time, you know, I was still with the girl that I was uh, dating at the time, mm. the same one who uh, I went through that unsuccessful attempt with. Um, so I left her house and I took the train and I waited outside with my mom while the cops went in and he was sure enough hanging from a banister. Mm. And uh, you saw it? it? No, 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 okay. no. They didn't. Uh, the police didn't let either okay. one of us go in, but they let us know what was going on in there. Um, so fast forward to that night that uh, I decided to take the pills. Um, I'm like, you know, I said, if there's anybody that's going to find me, it's going to be my mom. And I love my mom so much. Mm. I mean, you know, the epitome of a black woman. And I, I, I did not want her to go through that again, mm. you know, like her son, because nobody else probably would have checked for me. And if it would have been her again, I'm like, you know, so initially that phone call that I made to her was like, hey, ma, this is what I'm going to do. But I just wanted to let you know that this is what I'm going to do. And she was like, first of all, you're a fucking, I mean, <laughs> you good, <laughs> you good. she says, first of all, you're a moron because uh, you're not going to do nothing with no talent on PM. Right. And then she says, so stick your finger down your throat and then meet me at the crisis center. Uh, <laughs> Um, that nonchalant? Well, yeah, I mean, my mom's, a, again, she's a strong black woman. I got you. Uh, her favorite rapper is a tie between Lil Wayne and Rick Ross. Okay. okay? <laughs> she drinks Coke 45. Okay. She smokes Bud. You know what I'm saying? And uh, she's got a, a, a red fro. She looks like Malcolm X a little bit, right? Got um, I love her to death. Uh, but so uh, actually, she didn't even show up at the crisis spot. She had me go myself. And she's like, just call me when you get your, mm. your stuff together. So I went in there, and then I believe in angels. And, you know, the regular procedure with somebody who does what I do is, you know, they're supposed to um, go through all of these procedures and, uh, you know, be put in a room, et cetera, et cetera. But when she came to me, um, she just sat me out there in the lobby and started talking to me. And then she gave me the opportunity to walk through the, the psych ward. And then, you know, I'm pretty sure she violated HIPAA, but Mm. she was letting me know why some of these people were here. And then she, when she came back to me, she says, hey, listen, I could admit you, um, but I don't think you're a danger to yourself or others. I think you're just having a bad day. Mm. And she was like, "Uh, well, what do you do? What can we get you to do when you have bad days? And then she was like, well, maybe you should write. And then, you know, um, that was the first time I was, you know, supremely obedient. Like, I do have a history of obedience, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because I was prior military. So that was like forced obedience. But I think, like, there was something spiritual that took a hold of me mm-hmm. through this whole process where I needed to start listening to people. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the best advice I ever got was the advice from strangers. So, uh, it was that seed that she planted. Like, hey, next time you have a bad day, you should write your feelings down. Now, uh, to kind of make it romantic or, or, you know, to sew the story up, I guess, um, one, of the, one of the things that me and my, uh, my girlfriend at the time discovered was this was back when Deaf Poetry Jam was, like, popping back gotcha. in the day, right? And um, we had HBO, and it was like a snowstorm, and we caught a vibe with a bunch of them on HBO. <laughs> and then we ordered, like, the whole seven seasons. Shout out to Russell Simmons. Facts. Um, so we ordered all seven seasons of Deaf Poetry. I'm like, oh, this is fire. And then we, uh, and then we actually found a spoken word spot, and we went. Shout out to The Harvest. It's not around mm. anymore, but I still know a bunch of people that were involved. And so it was like a full circle moment. It was like, okay, you tell me to write. I was with my ex that, mm. you know, the relationship mm. didn't work out and we did poetry. So now I got this poetry thing here. Uh, I got a history as a rapper right. and this strange angel nurse woman, right. instead of committing me, just sent me home with a notepad and told me to write my feelings away. And next thing you know, 
Right. We just Mike the Poet. Right, right. We Dope. just Mike the Poet. Dope. Yes, that's the epitome of, uh, you know, pain into purpose, test into testimony. Mm. You know, I'm a, I'm a walking, like, I can't, I can't sit here as a successful poet. I can't sit here as a uh, financially free man without telling you about the, the pain and the failure that went into that because that's, you know, that's the most important part to me. Like anybody could be here like, oh man, a hundred thousand books sold or uh, tours, et cetera, et cetera. But nah, like the meat, the meat of my story is the pain. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I, I need to always, like anytime somebody, anytime somebody wants to praise me for my accomplishments, I, I, I gotta let them know that I don't, I don't want any puff pieces. I want people to know that this was built on the back of no trauma, trauma, on the back of probably the worst day mm. of my life. Right. And, you know, God's love and a couple angels, and I saw the other side. That's why I think the life I have now belongs to God because mm. I gave up on what I thought my life was going to be uh, mm. 11 years ago, right. you know? So now it's now I have a, the ultimate debt to pay. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that story. And I want to ask because a lot of what you share has a lot to do with transparency. Sure. The average person doesn't know what they're experiencing is grief. So they yes. don't know to name it grief. And then they also don't know how to actually share what they feel yeah. in a transparent way because society, well, now it's glamorized, but they use it in a way <laughs> um, to monetize right. it. So it's sure. not really real. When it is real, people feel that. Um, it resonates with their spirit, but you first have to get to a place to where you're not afraid to bear your soul to those who are not used to people transparently bearing their soul. My husband and I are very transparent. Um, my, you know, I've never had a a a, a passion to guide people the way that I do. Mm -hmm. That was never my passion. My passion was emotional (laughs) healing for myself. It was a very, you know, selfish thing. It's like, (laughs) I want to heal. I want to grow. I want to evolve. (laughs) And then just so happened by me sharing my transparency, I recognize that many people heal from that. They grow from that. It's, It's guidance for them. But I had to give myself permission to be as transparent not to help anybody, but because it was medicine for me. It sounds like transparency has been medicine for you as well, or has it? And if it has or has not, how did you get to the place? Because everything that you share has a huge level of transparency. Mm. Even when we saw you at AJ's event, I couldn't tell the first part if you were just speaking If you were just being transparent (laughs) or was this the poetry? I was like, well, has he started yet? (laughs) Either way, I'm 100%, you know, involved. But I recognize that transparency is a huge aspect of your story. How did you get there? Um, You know, you can't really, you can't really, no, not you can't, but I choose not to be an artist if it doesn't mean telling the truth. Mm-hmm. Because I, when I used to rap, everything I rapped about was false. Right. It was that. The, hour, the yeah. bricks that I was moving, right. the cars that I was driving, right. the, the Rolexes and chains that I, you never saw in mm-hmm. any of my videos, but I was always, you know, and um, at some point between the people who, like, you know, when you, when we were rapping, YouTube was kind of just starting. Absolutely. Right? So now, and then, you know, these, these DVDs, like, uh, yeah. these DVDs were coming out, and the whole hood was watching the right. DVDs. <laughs> and, you know, I've got my rapper friends, and then I've got my gorilla friends, right. you know, like the goons. Right. And, you know, you don't really know, you don't really know what's to it until you, until you sit down with a bunch of goons who are watching the blocks that y'all be on with all y'all cars and all y'all money, and then they want to go pay you a visit type <laughs> shit and stuff. And um, so it's like, man, like I don't want to be put in harm's way for stuff that I ain't got. Right. Plus, it don't even feel good to me, you know. I mean, it felt good for a time, but that was, you know, that was tantamount to just being around a bunch of people who all, 
you know, praise the same devil uh, and that devil just being just fraudulent, right? But since there's like this group to it, it's, we all support it. It's like, hey, listen, man, we we might only be making 500 a day on this block, but you can't get on the DVD saying you're making 500 a right. day. It's now it's 50,000 yeah, a day, right, right, right. So it's just putting a little hot sauce. Like I think all of the stories are real, but uh, it just want to be grandiose because uh, that's just what the streets like, right? So that that was that was like a catalyst. I said if I do poetry, um. I need to tell the truth. And as long as I'm doing that, I feel comfortable. Mm. And I, I said, I couldn't do this this way if, uh, if it wasn't authentic. Now, I didn't, I didn't understand what authenticity meant back then. I just knew I came from a place that wasn't authentic. And poetry was only meant for me to heal in the beginning. I, I didn't have an aspiration of being a poet. Mm. I put my feelings on the internet to vent, you know? And it was the reception of people. And everything I've done after that is what people asked me to do. They said, Mike, write mm. more. They said, Mike, write books. Mike, speak the poetry. Mike, take the poetry on tour. Mike, help me with my poetry, et cetera, et cetera. So everything I've done after that has been what people ask me to do. Because remember, it all started with somebody telling me that they wanted me to do something and write. Right. So once I, once I took submission and authenticity together, uh, we got a whole jungle of opportunity. Mm. So, so from the point when you actually did start to write, like you said, The Harvest, yes. you discovered that, you started to actually perform your pieces, I'm assuming, correct? Yes. <laughs> and you wasn't, <clears throat> you wasn't doing any poetry prior to that. It was just the history of rap and then I had the situation told to write, and then you start figuring out poetry, correct? Yes, yes. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, that's exactly how it was. I remember, uh, I'm like, yo, these are just words. These are just words. Right. I didn't even call them poetry mm. um, because I didn't, I had such respect for all of the people on HBO Got you. Who, were at, who were poets. Got you. And then, um, so when I, when I did it, I'm like, I, I don't even feel like, I don't even feel like I want to call this that. I just want to. I just want to share. Right. Right. And then uh, uh, open mics for poetry are such a safe space. Right. Right. Where you can vent, where you can chant, where you can cry, and people will wrap their arms around you. So it's the perfect place it's to heal. For you. Yeah. It's the perfect place to heal. And um, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted to share, and I, I signed that list one day and. <laughs> it was the cutest. It was the cutest little thing, bro. And like, um, people like people who were like real poets were mm -hmm. like, bro, you. Now your my bars probably weren't. You know, they're probably still not like top top no, tier, bars right? Is crazy. Uh, but Don't people do were that. like, yo, like it's like, yo, your whole persona is like authentic, right. it's genuine, right. and it's cute, quirky right. kind of. Right. No but I don't be making it up. Like it's not a shtick, bro. Right. Like, this is really yeah, me. Like That's how it comes <laughs> out. <laughs> no, yeah. it's like a, like you know. Um, and so I, I mean, that's what like uh, shout out to just just poetry in general for making that that safe space on the planet. So with that being said, f from rip, was it a matter where you was intentional in a lot of the content and your poetry being geared towards helping women heal? Was that always a thing? Nah, I think I think I think for me it is well. It's always. It's always been what I feel, what I want, and gotcha. and what I see, right? Now, from my brain and my heart, the way it gets out into the universe, those three thoughts, it, it kind of morphed into that. Gotcha. But it wasn't my intention. I think, I think people's affinity with me uh, only later on down the line came into inspiration, but that was on the backs of them reaching out to me and asking for that. Like I remember my first, my first two poems were, uh, I'm ready for love, which was just about me. You know, it was just about a poem that I wrote about the love that I was looking for. And then it wasn't until, you know, I think book number three, uh, once I became like a quasi popular poet, right. I would receive like maybe 
20, 25 emails a day. No exaggeration, because this was before DMs. Right. When I was on the internet. So I would receive all of these DMs from women like, you know, hey, Mike, I think you're a great writer. And I just like you because you're you're so genuine and you care about love and you want to fall in love. But here's my issue. Right. And then I saw a shift. I'm like, yo, like over one summer, I had about 10,000 emails. No exaggeration. And I, I said, all right, well, how can I respond to these mm. in a mass way? So I took all of those. I created a book called Dear Woman. And that book, right? I mean, I sold a thousand copies every Friday because that's as fast as my printer could print them. <laughs> I sold a thousand copies every Friday for like 13 weeks. Right. And then, you know, after that, it turned into like maybe 200,000 copies sold. And I think that's when that shift from Mike just gotcha. writing about what Mike's feelings were to Mike becoming good at giving people advice or just sharing his feelings about certain aspects. And that kind of shifted me mm. from being this, this cute guy who wants to, well, not cute like physically, but just like <laughs> war, right? It, it, that's where the shift happened right. to being this, uh, this voice to women, which I guess came by proxy. You know, like mm. Kiss said, the uh, <laughs> chicks will buy it, the thugs will yeah, dub it, no right? Doubt. So, I mean, I, I felt like, you know, poetry itself, like I wish more pe more guys came to the poetry shows because it's like no exaggeration. Like uh, a Just Mike show is like 40 to 1. Right, you of know? course. So 400 women, 10 guys, right. bro. We're we going to get to that too, yeah. <laughs> and nine of them came with girls who bought them. And they <laughs> exactly. be saying they were pissed, bro. <laughs> so I tried to I tried to uh, incorporate some, some male-oriented pieces mm -hmm. um, just to make them feel safe too. But... I think I think for me, putting it all together, it's uh, you know it's still what I think, what I feel, and now it's uh, what people want from me, because that's important as a as an artist. It's like you know you have to make the things that people wish. Absolutely. Did you have something, baby? Um, I wanted to ask you a follow up too with that because you've had. Hundreds of women actually tattoo their logo on you, right? Yes. Show them the logo I real to, quick. I had to get it myself. Wait, what? Yeah, yes. Oh, no, it's, it's more. It's more, it's, right? Uh, it's we're at uh, 119. 119. So you got women walking around with your logo because of what it represents really? to them, right? Really? Yes. You, you've literally had Halle Berry retweet. That's my dog. Yeah, that's my dog. That's my dog. <laughs> Shout out to HB. Yes. Right. You've had Halle Berry. You got it on an initial basis, right? Um, retweet herself um, with your shirt. No, no more boyfriends, no more boyfriends right? Boyfriends, yes. Um, so you've had this level of impact, and at this point, once you found your direction, once you found your groove, and you gave the people what they wanted to a certain degree, you are looked at like a superhero, right? But we asked Easy this same question because he kind of flexes in that capacity too. Mm -hmm. How do you see yourself? Because it's, that was that's what I was just about to ask. Right, because yeah. in, in this field, and I remember, um, you know, in the, the work that I do, I'm not as, of course, as viral or as out there as you are, but I kind of do similar work in a different industry. Sure. And I remember when I got the download, I was at a, uh, my first spiritual retreat. I thought all these people was crazy, but I was so desperate, blind, um, broken, kidney disease, all these different things. And I was discovering meditation was helping a little bit enough to the point where a few of those people paid for me when I was flat broke to come to Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So I get out there, the retreat was everything that I needed, and the last day we did um, a burn and bury ritual. It's like this um, space in Tallahassee, poplar trees, you could literally feel the ghosts of prior, like it's crazy, right? So we dig this, um, this pit, and we got this bonfire going, and everybody has to write down five blockages they felt was keeping them from, from their higher self. So I write mine down. It's the first time I cried in like 10 years, right? Mm. 10 years worth of tears started to come out, cry for an hour. And we all go back into the space to share. Yeah. It's me, maybe two other men outside of the actual men that was doing the uh, retreat. Yeah. It's like 15 women in here. Yeah. And one by one as they came in, there's women from all over the world, India, America, everywhere. They just sharing these stories of sexual abuse, yeah. molestation, yeah. rape, or seeing it with their mother and their sisters. And now I'm not only feeling my own stuff, I guess my ability to have empathy opened up in that moment, and now I can actually feel that trauma coming through me. 
So from that moment, I still had a lot of healing to do myself, but yes. I knew, just like you kind of discover, I right, this is my direction. Yeah. I knew my direction initially was to help women. Yes. Being in that field, though, I also know that how I get looked at sometimes, and I'm sure it's probably times 100 with you, even though the world kind of looks at you like a superhero, yes. to me sometimes, and I don't say this in a derogatory way, derogatory way, I feel like a custodian. Yeah. Right. Because I feel like my responsibility is to kind of clean the cobwebs of the hallways and women's consciousness in ways that I may be celebrated for. Mm -hmm. Where I feel like it's not worth me being celebrated because it's what all men supposed to be doing. Sure. But men are so far behind in their healing process that it leaves men like just Mike, AJ, myself looking like, oh, this is what it is. And we don't feel that for ourselves. So do you feel like more of a superhero or a custodian? Uh, I like I like vessel. Okay. I like vessel. Um, it's hard. <coughs> uh oh. It's hard because I got you, my brother. Appreciate that. Yeah. See, men can, men can show men love, man. It's all good. <laughs> it ain't gonna kill you. <laughs> right. right. Um. I think I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Absolutely. So. For people who say that, you know, Mike, your your book changed my life. I don't want to put water in that Kool-Aid. Absolutely. Because I don't want to discredit what that done to them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm whatever I need to be, but for but for God, I'm a vessel. That's why I take my shoes off. Uh, because everything that I have, everything that I am, just passes through me to, mm. to the people. Uh, the words aren't my own, mm. you know, my steps are ordered. So however however people see me, um, I'll be seen that way. Just don't, just don't care more about the words than the human. Got you. Like I, I, I wish to be the Clark Kent of Superman. Mm. You know, um, I'm going through a I'm going through this sort of thing right now because the way that the Internet is working, um, I'm going to need to I'm going to need to establish my likeness. I'm going to need to be more visually on the Internet. You gotcha. know, there's there is the, the biggest the biggest YouTube video I have is one that some girl shot. Gotcha. At my show, <laughs> I, I intentionally choose not to create my own content. Mm -hmm. I'll sit where content is being recorded, but I won't do this myself yourself. because I don't wish for popularity. Mm -hmm. If I could, if I could reach people, like I say it all the time, if I could do it all over again, I would use another human to mm. to be the face gotcha. of everything that I believe in because I don't want it to all fall on me because I'm still flawed. Got you. Um what does that mean? Can you explore that? I don't want it to fall on me because I'm still flawed. Because I feel like the more the more popular I become, the less freedom mm. I have. The more interviews I have, the more things that I say, they are, let's call them lynching points, possibly. They are, they, they put me and my personality, like, you know, like Kanye said, you can't even go to the grocery store, yeah. right? I don't wish for that. 2017, I was in the Dubai Mall with my mom on a Wednesday, and five guys from Nigeria saw me from four levels away screaming at the top of their lungs because they recognized just Mike the poet. Right. I don't wish that. Right. I'm at an airport in Ontario and the TSA lady has a whole breakdown. Hmm. Now I love it. I love it. I like that, but popularity for me is scary. Hmm because everything I do is under a microscope. Can you imagine every every time you go somewhere, anytime mm -hmm. you, you know, if I if I want to pull behind the Wendy's and take a leak, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and then every everything that's close to me becomes popular. Right. My mother, Got you. my sister, 
my love interest. And then there's the same the same apprehensiveness I had when I wanted to be a rapper, rapping about cars and shit that I, uh, stuff that I don't have. Um, my likeness is is puts me in jeopardy, you mm -hmm. know. And then I guess the flawed aspect comes because I'm not I'm not above failure. I'm not above, you know. Um, Grief, like I don't want to, I don't want to paint, I don't, want, I don't want to have to be this, like I don't want to be the light, I don't want to be the face of anything because you might catch me on a day where I don't feel like this, or uh, like I don't want to, I don't want to lead a a, a a a movement because I don't want to be responsible for the perpetuation of that movement, you know, like uh, uh, I want to build a church, but I don't want to be the pastor. And a lot of what you're saying is based on a topic that we talk about often on this show. I bring it up in my clients when I do counseling, but OPP, not Naughty by Nature's version, like I always say. The acronym for me means other people's perceptions, yeah. the op, if you will. And of course, a lot of that is valid and a huge part of somebody with your level of notoriety's um, life. Yeah. But what can combat that is your perception of yourself. And to a certain degree, we didn't get that answer of how Mike sees Mike, whether it's the superhero, the custodian, whatever it is. Because <laughs> e when, when we asked Easy uh, the same question, it was like, bro, I don't see myself as anything the world sees me as. To a degree, there was merit in why he didn't. To a degree, it was for him in certain ways, it was kind of minimizing himself, mm -hmm. um, leaving out beautiful aspects of himself because the world is watching me now. So how does Mike see Mike? And I do want to say one more thing to add to that, because when we asked Easy, um, he spoke about other people. Yeah, he spoke yeah. about his fans. Yeah. And so as you speak and I'm watching you, I am correlating the two of how men often Facts. take onus for other Facts. people around them, their, their, the society, the fans, yeah. the, the, the family, as opposed to really sitting with, how does this make me right. feel? How do I see myself? Do I even have the capacity when you have a TSA agent cry in front of you? Can you even feel like in your body like the it. gratitude of, and another thing that, you know, is one thing to just all praise to God. Yes. And then there's gratitude to be had when someone like a TSA agent just cries because you've helped them so much. Do you feel that in your body? Like, do you sense um, how great that is without, because you can sense how great that is without ego being present. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. But, but first, how do you see yourself in yeah. that one? You know, I'm probably the, I'm probably the hardest on myself out right. of anybody. Right. Because... Um, I've realized now that I'm talented and I'm not just, I'm not just a quirky little young boy who's, <laughs> you know, is, oh, this is my first poem. Y'all want to hear nah, it? I'm, I'm him. You know? Y'all want to hear it? go. I'm him. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's the curse of the gifted, you know, because uh, there's a line from a movie, uh, Along Came a Spider, and um, Morgan Freeman says, uh, what happens if you betray your gift? You know, he says you betray yourself, and I've been mm. I've been kind of living in that season. You know, it's like you know you're put here on life with a purpose, and you're supposed to find your purpose. And then not only are you supposed to find it, you're supposed to perpetuate it, right? So now that I've now that I've understood that, the the hardest part is like following that through, especially because. I'm not a I'm not a cooking like a cook recipe poet, right? Like all the poetry that I write is because it's it's feelings, right? So the 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 place that I have to get to to make this art mm -hmm. super emotional. I can't even do a funny poem mm -hmm. because I'm not funny. You do have <laughs> humor in your poem. Well, I mean, was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, 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 I, know what well, you mean. I, I mean, um, well, first, how I see myself, mm -hmm. it really depends on the day. Gotcha. Some days I'm super disappointed. You know, some days I'm super disappointed because uh, all the things we talked about, real estate, cannabis, and what it's done for me. And then it's like, you know, God, God took away, you know, God saved me. He gave me this purpose. And then I, I found a pivot from the purpose. 
and now I've kind of drifted away from the purpose, so I mm-hmm. feel bad, mm-hmm. right? I'm so I'm super critical. It's like, damn, Mike. Imagine if you would have constantly been a poet this whole time. You know, you probably could have been the top of the world. But I did not. You know, as I said, I did not want to do that because of two things. One is because I didn't want to trade my art for currency mm-hmm. on a daily basis. I didn't want to trade my art for for likes and follows. I didn't want to have that exchange where I'm only I'm not writing to write anymore. I'm writing to gain followers to pay my bills. And then two, um, I feel like I needed to make sure that everything that I do was authentic and I just wasn't in a place. So now, yes, I'm proud. I'm proud of the tattoos. I'm proud of the books. I'm Mm -hmm. proud of, you know, all the things that I've accomplished, but I know deep down in my heart, I've only, I've only hit the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And I'm sad because I realized that maybe my biggest calling in life might not be the one thing that I ordered. I tell people all the time, like imagine if you wrote a Christmas list down and you got two through 25 on your Christmas list, you know? And that's what I feel like my life is. Mm. I got two through 25 on my Christmas list, but all I wanted was a wife. The only reason I got here to poetry Mm. was because I thought I was Mm. gonna get married to this woman and it did not happen. And I've been this perpetual purgatory trying to get women to be less Mm. pet zoo and more observatory. So I'm in this poetic purgatory trying to get women to be less pet and zoo and more observatory. And that's just where I am. But I fear, I fear that, you know, I, <laughs> um, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Like I was hoping that maybe I find my wife and then I'll be this great poet because right. I got this that's my baby. Go <laughs> ahead, baby. We packing orders together. Right. I'm your road manager, tour manager, everything. But what if, what if that's not what God has designed for my life? What if God says, you know, you still have more work to do for me before I grant you with this blessing? Mm-hmm. And I don't think God is pleased with me. So I, I, I must continue to do this work because I, I, I understand his message and I, I'm not thrilled with it, but I understand it and I'm obedient. So now I got to live there. Um, Would you be open to a different or healthier perspective? <laughs> Would I be open to it? Yeah. I mean, well, you mean open to listening to it yeah. or open, open to accepting it as a path forward? Cause I those think, are different. I think you can take it or leave it mm-hmm. sure but open to hearing it yes well I'm, I'm hearing you've it. said twice i feel like god is displeased with me then you also said that um the the space that you're in is not really the space that you would prefer to be yeah. there's other things that you feel like if you had done those things i could be in in this place yes and could it also be true that god is 1000 percent pleased with you because where you are is just a part of the process of the journey the journey is not to go directly to the location you can pivot you can alter you can change but all destinations always lead you back home to yourself they always lead to the end goal of you fulfilling your soul purpose they always lead to the end goal of you coming to the idea hey, I need to pivot again, but it's still like a part of the totality of the journey that doesn't require God to be displeased with you, just patient with the fact that you're finding yourself or finding your way back to those paths, those ebbs and flows yes. in the journey that's going to automatically still lead you exactly where you're supposed to be. And let me, add, let me, let me add one more thing to that too, because working with a lot of men, I still do want to have a conversation on, you had a quote on why you don't write books for men. We'll get to that in a second. And I get it, trust me, being in the industry that I'm in, in the healing community, you said, uh, what, 40 out of 50 is gonna be women? Yes. For, for us, it's gonna be 48 out of 50. We may get two, yes. two brothers in there. But the men I have been able to work with, I had a men's group in Jersey for like a good four years, done retreats where men have come out, meditation, counseling, all this different stuff. But a lot of times when I work with brothers from any capacity, gender, race, um, money, the m- amount of money they make, there's always kind of this theme of additive based perception of myself, right? Mm. Where we still do need that masculine engine, 
of sure. I got to get to what's next. Um, I've fulfilled this particular phase of my pivot. I want to get back to my poetry. It may get to a point where that needs to pivot to something else. So we need that energy. Yes. We need that engine. But sometimes we do tend to get lost in the value, the effort we put in in real time in the moment. And just by you being a pure vessel, right? And yeah. the way you have been, whether it's the money making aspect of that, the poetry aspect, or whatever you feel compelled to do in that moment, that's success. Yes. So why is it difficult for you to see that within yourself? And feel it. Because mm. I feel the love here between you two. Mm. And I appreciate the way that you are actively, currently, in this moment, mm. pouring into me. Um, and I appreciate that, mm. the utmost gratitude but at the same, well, I don't want to say but mm -hmm. there. Uh, and and mm -hmm. I've been with myself for 38 years. Mm. And I know, I know what my capabilities are. And I gotcha. know what my duty is gotcha. at its fullest. Mm. And I know, I also know that I have not done that. Mm. Maybe, maybe if not even to God's standards, at least to mine. Right. And I can't, I can't wait until it's forced upon me because nobody's going to force art. Right. Nobody's going to force personal development, right? And I just know that two things. I know that if I if I pass away today, I would be so grateful. I would not have any regrets, right? Um, but at the same time, I know that I have not written my best poems mm. and I have not done God's work to my fullest potential. Mm. And until I can do that, I cannot, I will not, um, take what I've done already as mission complete because it was only the appetizer mm -hmm. and the, and the, it's not like I tried my hardest and I did not succeed. I succeeded beyond measure in the eyes of so many other people, but mm -hmm. I know gotcha. I was smoking mid proverbially. Right. Uh, and I just, I just need to do that for myself. At the same time, I appreciate it. It's like, Mike, come on. Like, right. Hundreds of thousands of books, 200 other authors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do you mean? You, you know, pivots, pivots, pivots. But I know me. I know when I got into real estate, it was uh, deflecting my art. I know when I got into cannabis, it was deflecting my art. I know when I took breaks from poetry to go fall in love with women who I probably shouldn't have. It was all deflecting me from art because of the pain that I must harvest because of all of the stories from women, like being connected to women in this way, people just automatically assume it's like, oh my God, Mike, you got it good. You got hundreds of women coming right. to your shows. But every time I perform, it's, it's everything I got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not, we're not, I'm not hosting a, a, a R and B karaoke right. vibe. This is church. Mm. in these places and the amount of myself that I give to these people mm. it's a it's it's a feeling and it's just, it's just sometimes it's so hard hey. it's so hard to constantly do it to, I mean to take me back to that emotional place now I will I will not go I will not pivot within poetry right right I don't want to be a I don't want to write poems about Slavery mm. and emancipation and, you know, black power. Gotcha. No, 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 no. <laughs> Everything that I do is based on the one, the one gift that this planet was great at giving. And that's romantic love from a stranger. It's the most beautiful thing. Right. It's the most beautiful concept. Forget real estate, right. right? Forget capitalism. The most beautiful concept of the planet outside of loving your mother is finding a woman mm -hmm. who was a stranger to you that becomes everything that's a partner in life. Mm -hmm. 
And that's that's beautiful. And I want to I want to speak life into that because I, I believe that's what's going to make this world a better place. What if the pathway, which is the journey, <laughs> yes, for you to get to that place, which is your number one on your list, right? Yes. Your Christmas list. Yes. What if the key to unlock your number one on your Christmas list is you having the ability to give yourself grace? Mm. Mm. So that means the understanding is still the understanding. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> the understanding is still the understanding. It doesn't diminish or take away from the fact that you still know to your core, to your soul, that you still have work to do. Yes. And what if the key to unlocking the work that you really want to get done is your ability to give yourself grace and feel the gratitude for where you are right now without being focused on the future, but that present space of I feel this gratitude, I feel everything that I've done, and I give myself grace for all the moments that I've pivoted in spaces that may not have been that healthy, that may have distracted me from what I know my eye on the prize was. What if the ability for you to attract your number one, because you mentioned it a couple times, what if that's based on you giving yourself grace? How sweet the sound. <laughs> How sweet the sound. I think as you as you speak, I'm intentional about listening to you. And while you were giving me those sentences, I realized that I have never given myself grace mm. in any moment in my life. Mm. Being black, male, inner city, single parent, woman led household with little sister i was i was thrust into manhood in fourth grade mm. sixth grade by sixth grade i was food shopping doing laundry homework walking my sister to and from school supreme babysitter you know grace wasn't an option. Mm. I had a mom who was processing divorce, poverty, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as you as you talk about, you know, because my first my first responses was like kind of how it was the first time you shared it to me. But then I said, you know, let me let me let me really think about what she's asking me to do. And I realize why there's so much angst. Mm. It's because I have never given myself grace. Mm. And grace is different than accolades. Grace is different than financial freedom. Grace is, grace is bro, one, stop, right? Uh, two, I think, I think, <laughs> I think I thought that Grace was going to be my wife. Mm. I thought Grace was going to be my wife. I thought Grace was a blessing of having this woman who, who would pour into me. And it's not until just now that I realized that connection and why I long for it. I still want a wife. Of course. <laughs> I still want of course, a wife. Of course. But when we when we take the wife grace combo and we untie those things, now I'm nervous because the beauty of my art comes from the sadness sometimes. Mm. So as long as I'm able to channel that immediately, it makes for more impactful art. You know? There's certain songs that I play to help my writing process, mm. and they're all sad, <laughs> right? So hopefully Grace won't have me write into 42 Doug, free, free Doug. Um, but, uh, damn, that was a double entendre because he's got a song <laughs> called Grace. That's crazy, right? <laughs> that was deep. I'm really a writer. <laughs> but nah, 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 nah. Grace, Grace. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Let's go. Um, it's but no, there. but no. Um, I mean, I've been I've been the man hmm. since the beginning. Respectfully, <laughs> right? I mean, um, you know, I did my first poem in 2012. Uh, I wrote my first book in 2012, 12, 12, 12. Mm. By March of that year, I had already quit my job and dropped out of school. March of 2013, I'd already quit my job and, you know, dropped out of school. And I was already a full-time poet after like nine months of poetry. Mm. And then, you know, six months later after that, I released my second book. Now I got like six figures. I never had six figures before in any other arena as a military member or nothing. And then at that point, I did my first 30 city tour. I did, shout out to Viz and Jamar, we did 30 cities in 50 days. Mm. Just out of out of sheer will in conference rooms, you know? And it was, it was just like this nonstop thing. And then the accolades just kept coming. It's like, oh my God, sold out mm. show, sold out show. We got books, we got books. I'm speaking at Howard, Temple, Spellman, Morehouse. I, you know what I mean? It's like, wow. You know, so I had to, I had to, block out the grace because I didn't want to be right. over gracious right. with myself, you know, stay low, right. you know, because I did not, I mean, to some point, maybe who I am naturally, the ego wouldn't have got in there, but right. I, I did, I did a lot of ego maintenance. It's like, yo, bro, you really the shit, but you're not though. You just Mike. Right, right. These are just words. You're right. just Mike the poet. Everything that I did was contrary to grace. And now, sitting in this space, um, I'm forced to I'm forced to acknowledge that, and I have to, uh, and now I have to I have to look at it differently, because I cheated myself out a lot of a lot of love by not giving myself grace, um, you know, and then. Success, success puts you in a different stratosphere mm-hmm. from a lot of your family mm-hmm. and a lot of the people close to you. I understand the struggle that most many successful people go through, especially financially, because your mom ain't your mom the same. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Your friends ain't your friends the same way, you know? And there's a lot of perversion and manipulation that comes with that. So you're a popular loner. Mm, so you don't extrovert, yeah. you don't get the and then a lot of times when people when people when people see that you have success, they think that the grace is the batteries included and it's not. Mm. So you don't get it poured into mm. you don't get poured into that way. Right. Because oh Mike, you're already <laughs> successful. Yeah. You don't gotta work no more. You doing right. your thing. Like we don't gotta love on you. Right. Cause you straight. Right. Not to blame my village for absolutely. my lack of no, grace, absolutely. but I'm I'm in real time trying to process right. how I can move forward differently because I believe every interaction that God puts me in, whether it's the woman sitting next to me on a plane or the people that he puts next to me on podcast, and I don't believe any any words that God sends through all the people in my circle mm. are unnecessary. So there is purpose here. Right. And I think beyond just the pleasantries of doing a podcast, uh, the real work is the real work. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. in real time. Right. So as much as, as much as, as much as it's incumbent upon us to have a successful podcast for the people watching, it's incumbent upon me to take these two vessels that God sat in my lap mm, and right. to try to process what this, what my message on this good Sunday is. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I apologize if I'm nah. up two trays of thoughts, but <laughs> you know, like this is this is what real work looks like. I, I think it's important, especially for the men that will watch this, to watch the vetting process happen in real time for a man for masculine energy. Absolutely. Because masculine energy in its essence, not just men, women, but the energy itself is so mm-hmm. angular and so binary. So we can easily get caught up in this world of all or nothing. I'm either gonna be completely humble and not allow myself to experience grace for myself, or I'm just gonna be all together the arrogant and out here there's a lot of gray area that a lot of times men don't have um uh comfortability in and i remember from my first rap song i ever made i remember the lyric where i said pain is impromptu you got to practice joy you can 
uh, exchange joy with grace. And it's a muscle, right? And your story is a lot like a lot of men's story, especially a lot of black and brown men's story, where we had to grow up super fast. Our dynamics of why that happened may be different, but a lot of us understood our survival and the survival of the people around us are about us becoming men. A lot of times before we should have even done that. And like you said, once you get to that point where you discover your purpose, you pop in, the money is coming, the women are everywhere. There's no time to even recognize this skill set may not exist within me yet. And if it needs to exist, I need to be able to have time to give intention to it, to even practice having grace for myself. So a question I ask a lot of men, um, people in general, and I'm not even asking you this, this is rhetorical, but I ask a lot of people, what percentage of your thoughts about yourself are negative? The average answer is 85. And whatever answer people give me- I was me, gonna go 70, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna go 70. What, whatever <laughs> answer people give me, I tack on another 10% because they are trying to be polite to the, the, what they own minds do to them. But practicing and developing the muscle of grace is when those negative thoughts come, you have two categories for them. It's one, it's true, right? The negative things you say about yourself that may need to be developed or you, you got to get better at, it may be true. And if it is, that's still not the end of the world or reason to beat yourself up. Because now, all right, I extract out what well, if this is the case, what I got to work on, how do we do that? Let's create the system. The other half of it, and a lot of times, it's on this end of the spectrum. It's not actually true about ourselves. The things that we say to ourselves to beat ourselves up or to, to demean ourselves, to not allow grace to happen, it's not even real. It, a lot of times it'd be fallacy. But to develop the muscle, you first got to catch where the mind is going. This is why, as a meditation teacher, being able to recognize what thoughts we live in as opposed to what thoughts we rent is super important. And when you can catch it, you are able to categorize what's what and that starts to develop that muscle of grace but what you just did is no apologies necessary for Absolutely. that men have to be able to see especially a man of your caliber be able to do that in real time that was beautiful yeah it was because i felt the resistance mm -hmm. and yeah. i knew i had to go mm -hmm. in a different route <laughs> sure. but i love that you had the ability to it was the word it was it was grace and i think that's the word that everybody for the most part you said it was a muscle. We mm -hmm. have to practice that mm -hmm. muscle because that looks like not even saying things like I missed the mark. I missed the mark implies that I did something wrong right. or I didn't do something right as opposed to this is just the path that I took on the journey that still leads me back to myself. And maybe I did take a path that makes me have to walk a little bit further than it would have if I made this decision. But if I still find my way back home to myself, even in the thought process, I'm still allowed to give myself grace. And I feel for you, that's just what resonates in my spirit. It may not resonate in yours, but it feels like God is saying, you good. Grace is present. If you want me to give you grace, if I'm a reflection of you, don't you first have to practice that within yourself first. Mm -hmm. So I love that you gave yourself permission to process that. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted no. to add? All right. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to drift off a little bit into the conversation about women. because yes. of And not just your role, <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> not just your role as a poet, but when I read this, um, one of which you posted on your own Instagram that it was at a certain point you was 100 days in sleeping alone. Yes. Right? Um, and, and, then, and, that, and then, but look, that coupled with H HB, as you call it, what up, HB, yes. right? Um, HB promoting the shirts, the tattoos, all these different women all over the world. When I saw that you were quoted and saying you have never crossed that line with what you consider to be a fan, is that correct? Yes. Bro. <laughs> I have never met a man in yeah. your position that has been able to say that. And part of what I felt, my bad, part of what I felt in my first time seeing you live perform, your authenticity, your vulnerability, it felt like catharsis. Even though the women were swooning, um, you know, you were a handsome brother, you put together. It was beyond that because I felt like complete genuineness in the fact that these uh, quips, these epitaphs have really come from my pain that I've been through and may still be experiencing. Yes. And that kind of purifies you a little bit when you are in this world full of women yes. and you still have the ability to not engage on these levels. Talk about that a little bit. You know, sometimes I want to award for how I don't do people. Mm. Okay. But... 
Bars. Bars. Yes. But even 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 in saying that, that's like that's like anti Christ like because that's who I was supposed to be anyway, gotcha. right? So there's a slippery slope with that. Gotcha. But I mean, it's more so to the people who do weird things that I don't do weird things back to. But I mean, jokingly I could say, you know, like there's you know, I told myself a long time ago that God gave me this flock of people because he trusted them with me. Mm. And he would shut this whole thing down if I ever used it or mm. perverted it for my own personal sexual thing, you know. Now, if you're if you're like 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 if you're the bartender at the at the at the at the show that don't count. <laughs> that don't count, right? <laughs> if your girlfriend, if you're the girlfriend that your girlfriend bought right. with you, that almost don't count either. Right. But like, um, I had I had a brief experience. Two, mm-hmm. one girl I met after a show and she was married mm-hmm. and her, her, a friend of hers just DM me and was like, hey, you know that girl who uh, you gave your number to last night at the show, she was married. Mm-hmm. And this was like, this was like my third show ever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, shut up. Right. So, and then the, the, the second time was, um, was... I guess it's really, it's really, really hard. Uh, well, let me let me say it a different way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I jokingly used to say, like, "Man, I'm gonna meet my wife at one of these shows," right? Right? And then I don't know if that's like <laughs> uh, manifestation or marketing. Right, right. right. <laughs> or, <laughs> both. <laughs> or both. But you can't. But again, it's like, you know, like back to the op thing. Right. Um, you, you don't know. You want to be very careful with perception. Mm. I mean, because per, mm. I mean, perception is relative, but it's like, yo. Absolutely. Like, I, the last thing that I need is for people to assume that I write what I write as a form of pandering right. or just capitalism right. turned heart, heartbreak turned capitalism right. type shit. Um, so it, like I'm still torn, mm-hmm. but I, I know that deep down I, I'm responsible for everybody that God puts in front of me. And I just don't, I don't, I don't want that. Mm-hmm. Cause that, that mm-hmm. equal yoke thing is crazy. Like, Thanks, bro. like there are women who, who read all my books, been to my shows, right. watched me on live, subscribed to my podcast. Right. You know pretty much everything about me. You profess your love to me. I see you as a stranger. Right. We don't have a we don't have a path forward. Right. Right. And you know, if I meet you, you already sold on me, but I don't know you. Mm. Now, if I entertain the idea of you and I realize I don't like you, mm. but I preach about wanting to fall in love, mm. and now to you, I'm some sort of fraud just because I did not right. want to, right. you know? So it's best to, it's best to, uh, it's best to kind of s- separate those two, you know, because I that de- one, the pressure, but two, it's like, it's like I don't want I don't want what I build here to be on the on the back of misogyny. Right. Um, I mean, I don't think it could be, but because that's just not who I am. But, but it's also a slippery slope. But it's also a slippery time. slope. Yeah. It's a slippery yeah. slope. And it's like, you know, I mean, it's just tough, bro. It's tough. Now, let me let me ask you this too, because for men that uh, may be watching, if they never heard of you before, they know who you are now. Based on some of the things we've talked about that you've been successful with, um, at a certain point, we have to be able to exist in this posture you're in, as far as how you are with women. Yes. You have to be able to separate aesthetic beauty from sexual desire. <sighs> and me and my wife were just talking about wait it yesterday. Minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. I need you to unpack that. Okay. So I remember- Separate, or have, I need you to say it again first. We, we need to unpack. be able to separate aesthetic beauty from sexual desire. 
separate why because if you don't you're going to be at the whim of all these beautiful women out here and i remember when i was first starting i did a year of celibacy my name is mike and i'm at whim <laughs> <laughs> my name is mike and i'm at whim you shit me <laughs> but to a certain degree you are doing it because a lot of these right. women you would oh. entertain on a physical level but your work your intention and what you do is keeping you honest right yeah. you're already doing it though you just yeah. may not be conscious that you're doing it yeah. but any successful man um if, if y'all ever gonna read um the ways of the superior men or things like that when i started to rehome my sexual energy i did a year celibacy um not just uh physical sex with a woman but no masturbation like no climax whatsoever and i remember it was like maybe the third or fourth month in and the brother that kind of initiated me into this path and taught me yoga and meditation. It was summertime, like what sundress season was coming back on. It's just like, bro, the like I'm, <laughs> I'm the like, clappers. <laughs> I'm like three, four months into this process. And I know he's done this already at this point. He was already married. So I'm like, yo, bro, how am I supposed to do this? Like, I feel like I, I'm getting the benefit of keeping my sexual energy, but they everywhere. Like, how do you do this? And he was pretty much saying what helped him was to be able to reprogram or recode, not just a beautiful woman, not just a fat ASS or a big, you know what I mean? To see a piece of God and to also on the other end of it, see a, a being that may be so damaged, she's going to damage you, right? So now it went beyond just the lady lumps and her looking good. And now there were other stories that I had to weigh aesthetic beauty against sexual desire and what's in between that is what was kind of wreaking havoc in my life when I didn't have okay, that distance from okay, it, right? Okay. So everybody, well, every man that gets to that point where he starts to develop that skill set, whether he's conscious of it or not, he has his own way of going about that. What's some of the, I guess, helpful tips you could give to brothers that want, do want to stop being a slave to their D? I can't preach to that choir because I need confession first. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> nah, I mean, uh, I haven't had sex since November and that's an anomaly mm -hmm. outside of my military service. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think it was that long when I was in the military because, um, I mean, I'll share it here cause this is a safe space. Mm -hmm. Like when I joined the military, I was 17. By the time I was 18, I was in Jacksonville, Florida. And we were stationed, I mean, uh, we went to, like, South America. And, you know, like, this was the early 2000s, maybe 2002, 2003. Um, and we would stop in these cities, Panama, Ecuador, Chile, Costa Rica, <laughs> right? I already know where you're going, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, you know things things happen of course and i think i think not to <laughs> i was exposed to sex early like i probably only had sex with two girls before i joined the military um but in that one that one little 7 month deployment i quickly escalated from two to 40 right because again it's just kind of like the rapping thing right, you know no monkey see monkey do like absolutely you know um this is you know uh two months after i left boot camp i was already on the water on my way to panama mm. Mm. so you know life was moving fast like Two months before, two months before I joined the military, I got arrested. So I got arrested in July. Mm -hmm. The judge said, "All right, you're 17. If you go to the military, we'll throw away your record." Two months later, I was got in, you. I was in the got military, you. right? Uh, no, no, I didn't know jack about the military. I just picked the navy because they said you could travel the most, wow. right? Mm -hmm. I took the ASVAB. I got a high score, and then they just sent me away. Two months later, I was in boot camp. Two months after boot camp. I was in Jacksonville, Florida, and then I was, at, uh, two months after that, I was on the water. And then after that, we're pulling into these cities, and I got all of these people who've been in the Navy 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. and they're all they're talking about is, man, I can't wait till we go to Panama. Mm -hmm. This is a norm <laughs> right? in the military. <laughs> right? They and then can't it's wait like, to deploy for and that then reason. It's like, and then it's like, you know, like, okay. And then, you know, I'm still green as a cooking apple, right? So, uh, you know, I'm thinking, all right, bet. 
you know, we go, I'm going to call my mom and we we'll get some real food. Right. And I'm going to go have a drink or two. You're not even thinking about what they are. <laughs> right. No, 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 no. I mean, but then, but then it's like, you know, you have these greeters that they'll come in and then they'll say, hey, you know, these are the safe spots in town. These are some places that we recommend. And this is where we all meet up together before we go back. Now, I don't know if this is by design or however, but, you know, all of the ship, you know, all of the people on the ship, we usually all end up at the same spot. And then, you know, by, by four or five o'clock, it's just Drake's and we're playing skee ball and mm -hmm. bull crap. But by like nine, 10 o'clock, you start seeing these girls come, <laughs> right? And the party is starting. And I'm like, and then it's like, okay, like, well, what is this? Like, I'm still green. And then they were like, yo, bro, like, this is. <laughs> that's why we here. <laughs> you, know, that's, you know, it's like, you know, and it's like. Salsa nights. <laughs> You know, and then and then it was like I mean, but that was that was sex trafficking, in mm. a way, yeah, right? And it but and, mm. it, and it's like you know it it didn't dawn on me in real time. I'm just like this 18 year old guy. Right. There's these two girls. They're like rubbing my head, talking about you want to go upstairs, and they only wanted like ten dollars a piece, fifteen dollars a piece, and the same. And it's like all of the guys I'm hanging out with, they like what, bro? You tripping? You better, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. And then it's like, well, shit, why not, <laughs> right? right? And then it became it became like a thing. And, you know, fast forward to Panama, Ecuador, Chile, Costa Rica, and then you go back out on the water, you come back in for three days, and then it, it, it became like a, it became like this thing. And then I thought it was just this one ship of bad guys, but as I grew in the military, it's that shit's everywhere, and it's and it's every it's a lot of these countries: Singapore, Thailand. And it's I mean, it's the that's why so many military veterans have children all over the place. Mm. They can't wait to deploy because they you get know? to experience that. Yeah. Now I didn't like. I mean, I got out the military at twenty one, but uh, to your point of like that desire, I was kind of tapped out after like military. Gotcha. You. you know, like women sexually to me. It was like, bro, like, you know, I had a, I had a, like, you know, after, after the one time with the one girl, that was, right. now it was two girls, and then it was three girls, then it was two guys and five girls, then it right. was four guys and nine girls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, at the, at that point, it kind of, it kind of leveled off and it's like, man, you know, you got to find something deeper to believe in, you know, you got to find another affinity for women outside of the Absolutely. flesh. Absolutely. Um, so for for me, I think any man that wants like he won't be able to do that until he's reached his own personal pinnacle with the flesh. I mm -hmm. think I think that uh, it's it's kind of hard to tell a brother to turn the water right. off before his cup is full. Right. And everybody's going to be different. Yeah. Right. So I think and, and and to be honest, I mean I don't. There's a slippery slope, right? Because you don't want to condone like trafficking, right? Absolutely. There's a lot of women who are in sex work who don't wish to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking about those, sure. right? I'm talking about the people who understand it as a lifestyle, accept their own sexual fluidity, right? I'd rather a man go explore those sexual urges with those people who are consenting to it in that way, vice taking a regular woman who they find beautiful and trying to coerce and massage them. I'd rather you go to DR, bro. Go to Sasua. Right. Do your thing with people who want the thing done to them. Right. Vice, vice, try to fulfill these sexual needs with people who are interested in a, a more mature bond. Right. Because that's dangerous. But um, it, I, I can't. I can't. After after fulfilling my own urges, uh, I can't tell somebody how to turn their water off. Right. I would just say f fulfill it. Hopefully, as soon as you can, because you realize that, yo. Like a bad girl's gonna turn eighteen every day, bro. Right. And if as long as you're attached to the flesh, right. you're 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 only gonna be attached to like a certain age demographic or, or physical fitness component to women. And that's dangerous for your own personal right. future. Yeah. Um, and and I, I was saying to my wife, like, um, because you know, um no, everybody has a different way of going about their life. Everybody has a different path. Poly is very popular right now. Whether you polyamorous, polyandry, polygamy, it, do your thing. I have no nothing against any of that. But a lot of times the people that I do talk to um, that talk to me about that lifestyle, if they're interested in it or they're already doing it, they talk about that is freedom. And to a certain degree, from a certain vantage, it can be. For me now, I was just telling my wife yesterday, like, freedom for me is being able to walk past a New York City block of 100 women. 
I still have eyes. I can see number five was beautiful. Number seven was whatever it is. But I, that doesn't go to now sexual desire. Now that woman is running through my head all day. I'm regretting not trying to holler at her. Or pick. That's the, for me, that's yeah. the real freedom to like really be completely comfortable in what I got with my wife and be able to recognize other women are beautiful. And I don't want y'all. That takes all the pressure off what I used to feel and not only juggling the women I was dealing with, but then that constant pressure of trying to get more and add another body to the count, that's going now. So t to a lot of brothers who may not realize this end of the coin ain't just boring and then the level of trust and loyalty and having somebody that really is interested in loving me, like there's a freedom in that that a lot of brothers don't realize. Go ahead, you wanted to say that? I wanted to say um, in regards to how women see you, see you, is very, I know how women see men <laughs> based on how I see men. Yeah. And so when you are in a position of being elevated in mm -hmm. your position, right? You're elevated in your position. My husband is elevated in his position. There are many people who come to you both for specific things, mm -hmm. for guidance, for leadership that look up to you and are, and are in awe of you, how yes. you move, and not just what you do as far as success, but the, the masculinity that you have that many women have never been privy to, that have always wanted that, the safety that they've looked for, the mm -hmm. provision that they've looked for, even in just being able to give advice. These are coupled in what most women have never experienced with having a father, with sure, having a dad man. around, right? Sure. So now that you you see someone who has the ability to have that, it's normal for women to kind of like gravitate towards that. So even with my husband, I'm very clear that women may like me because they like the idea of us, but many women are just in awe of him and to a certain, a large degree, most women would be very uncomfortable with that. Right. The reason why I need and not need, but enjoy the fact that women see my husband in a way that they see him is because I know that it's also healing for them to have that type of mm. masculine energy they can feel safe around, that masculine That's energy nice. they can feel provided for in, in in regards to advice, that masculine energy they can come around and feel like, I don't feel like Docs is gonna do anything. I don't feel like he's gonna you know, do anything that's gonna make me feel uncomfortable. I don't feel like he's gonna disrespect his wife in any way. Yeah. And on top of that, I actually still find him attractive. I find these attributes attractive oh. and I'm in all of these things and knowing that it's not going anywhere feels like safety to them. So when it comes to things like Kira coming on the podcast, right. I heard Kira speak about you being the first man, one of the first men that she that she trusted, yeah. that she felt safe with. Yeah. I knew that it was necessary for her to have the conversation on the logistics to do this podcast only with my husband. Yeah. Because right. that gives her opportunity to now further the indication that men can be trusted safe, yeah. yes. right i can be uh safe in these environments with men there are more men out there especially because women have this narrative that all men ain't nothing right and it's not true <laughs> so i kind of like have my husband like see y'all yeah. can feel <laughs> safe with my husband yes. so i want to know from you mm. what does that feel like to be a safe place for mm. um well actually from both of you what does it feel like to be a safe place for women who've never been able to experience that before you want to go first? You're, you're the guest you gotta go first <laughs> you know i think i think I think a lot of my makeup was here. A lot of this motor was here before the popularity. Right. So right. a lot of these things aren't, are, I mean, they're just innate. Um, and I, I mean, that's that's one of them. I, I feel like I had to make my mom and little sister feel safe mm. from the rip. And then my fascination with women uh, followed right behind that. So I've always had, I've always had this, this desire to make women feel safe. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. and then I think because I was handsome and kind, I never really had to be aggressive right. to get anything that I wished from women. Same. So it was never really a need to be predatory. Um, and it, I mean, we, we, I've just, I've just 
stayed that course, you know? Now, to Dox's point about the visuals, mm-hmm. um, I like to think that all of the women I've loved are probably some of the most beautiful women walking the earth. Mm-hmm. And maybe to my own personal detriment uh, in my quest for a wife, I find the aesthetics too essential. Got you. So, uh, to be fair, I feel like a lot of the people probably wouldn't even register to me because I look for something so unique aesthetically. Now, not just physical beauty. Of course. Like facial, but it's just the whole aura of women. So, a lot of women, it's like, I don't even, (laughs) nah, I don't want you, but (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I have such a high level desire and it's so specific, right? That um, another thing that helps with the safety is that like, yo, like I really don't, this really does not move me. Yeah. Like respect, respectfully, I think all black women are beautiful. All black women are gorgeous. All black women are amazing. But I know personally after my experience with them, uh, I'll be foolish as a 38 year old, year old man to not be specific about what I want, right? All of the, it would have been everything that I've, every interaction with my woman, with women I've had would be pointless if at this juncture, I still couldn't keep my D in my pants, still had exactly. over desires for flesh. Exactly. If I was still moved by uh, immediate sexual gratification, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like those are, those are rudimentary uh, trophies that you know, I hung on my wall 20 years ago. Right. You know what I'm saying? So elevation doesn't require separation. It sometimes it breeds separation. And I think that's just where I am today. And then on my end, it would be probably um, my ability, my access to still be able to have intimacy with women in a completely different way. Absolutely. Like, you know, um, beyond just the official counseling sessions I do, I still... I'm in a, a DM a lot from women reaching out to me, asking questions, things of that nature. So sometimes I may be right in the, in the bed next to you. I'm about to beat the brakes off you in about 20 minutes, right? Praise the Lord. Which is our intimacy, <laughs> <laughs> right? But I'm able to have this genuine... Be nice, be nice, be nice. We got company. Um, but I'm able to still have this very intimate moment where a woman is opening her trauma to me, her soul, her transparency and allow me to look into it and offer guidance in whatever way I can. That feels probably more intimate than anything I could have had with that woman on a physical, sexual level, 10, 15 year old version of myself. So now I kind of almost have the best of both worlds where I genuinely don't want nobody but my wife, but I'm still able to play this big brother role. I'm able to play the father or the uncle role of women that may not have had a healthy example of those things. I'm still able to pour into women's path. And that feels extremely good. And it also factors into the frequency I'm sending out into the world, into the grid, the universe, to God's heart, if you will. And that has also impacted my ability to expand as an individual. And I know a lot of men are bottom line based, again, masculine. We are bottom line based. So if, if we feel like it ain't going to affect our, our pockets and things of this nature, we really don't care. I didn't go into it for that, but I realized that by honoring these women in these ways, helping when I can, honoring this type of intimacy, that everything kind of takes care of itself around me. So sure. it's beautiful to be able to have the best of both worlds and beat the brakes off and all that. <laughs> I know, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that was my main thing when it comes to men. I've never, I've had probably on, on if I can count on 10 fingers, how many men I've actually felt safe with. Mm -hmm. And then to have a husband that I actually feel extremely safe with, knowing that other women have the ability to feel that too. And it's like, no, she needs that. She needs this conversation. She, and they come to our sessions when we have things here, yoga, meditation, and they just are like, Docs, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, that that doesn't make <laughs> me feel a way. Right. I know the average woman would be like, don't talk to my man, or they would have some type of you know emotional reaction to that. But to me, it feels like we all need right. this. That's reparenting. Absolutely. And I'm um, in your position. You definitely need that. Whatever your partner is on her way to you, she's definitely gonna have to be able to have that skill set. A um, few more things for you. No, um, got- I definitely yeah. wanted to ask you about this. Um, your uncle Clarence. Yes. Right? 
Yeah, pray for him. 70 years, 70 years of, marriage of marriage. Yes. And had to lay his wife down. Yes. Whether it was that day, whether it was you thinking about that experience of having a mate for 70 years, yes. the aftermath, what have you learned personally from witnessing him have to do that and any, any thoughts you may have had after that about like detachment and being able to let go of that level of love to that degree? Um, shout out to my uncle Clarence. Uh, mm. He was just diagnosed with stage four prostate mm. um, and he's not, ref he's, he doesn't want any treatment, mm. um, but I understand him. Absolutely. Because he lost his everything. Um, so uh, I feel like that's the perfect example of what I think love is about. And it really put my own, like, not lack of, but it made me realize that I only loved when things were okay. Mm. I've loved <laughs> a nice amount of women over the last, first first woman I fell in love with was Shauna Butler when I was 16 years old. Um, and that was 22 years ago. Mm. And every relationship, and I've loved probably, let's call it a dozen, mm -hmm. or, uh, over the next 22, 23 years, um, and I love them all. But there were there were situations where our love required forgiveness, mm. and I was not I was not willing to do that work where love required patience, mm. all the things that love is really, truly built on. And I, when I ask myself, like, why don't I have that Uncle Clarence sort of love? It's because when, you know, it's like becoming human in a way. Like, uh, the most impactful relationship I had was my most recent one. And there was a 12 year age gap. Mm. Um, you she, being older? Yeah. Okay. I was uh, 33, she was 23. And I watched a woman after, uh, well, we DM'd for six months before we even saw each other. And then we saw each other maybe four times, four trips over the next six months. And then I decided that I wanted her to live with me. And I was 35 at this time, and she was uh, 23. And um, I'd never lived with a woman before. <laughs> I'd never lived with a woman before. Mm -hmm. I, I think the longer, I mean, I did a lot of shacking. You know, it was like, all right, we stay at your house tonight, <laughs> right. my house that yeah. night. But I never, I was never responsible for a woman in that way. Um, but it taught me so much about myself because, you know, people think the representative is like that first 90 days of dating. It's like, no, it's everything that you do until we cohabitat, mm. right? Mm. And then that's when that's when the armor comes Absolutely. off. That's when Can't you can see no the more. cracks yeah. and the, you know, and I had never, I had never, I had never, I had never seen that mirror before. Mm because that's all it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a mirror. When you have a person that lives with you, it's a mirror into everything. Yeah. And I didn't really like some of the things that I was seeing. And of course, your immediate reaction was to just be done with it. But um, she was a fighter and I was a fighter. Like, I, <laughs> like she was a fighter. Um, and I chose to fight because she was fighting. Now, granted, obviously things still didn't work out, but um, the the beauty in it is that I learned that, yo, know, like the type of woman you need to be with is less about how she looks and more about how she feels. And the type of man that a woman stays with is less about Facts. how he what he does for her, but how he makes her exactly. feel. Now, granted, I think overall, 
I don't think a 10, 12 year age gap is the worst, but I do think early 20s to early 30s is two li- life in two different directions. Absolutely. So, I mean, I kind of, I probably could have maintained the relationship, but I thought, like, yo, like, I'm 34, I'm 35, I'm trying to get you knocked for real. Right. And you don't even, you right. know what I'm saying? You're not trying to make no gumbo from scratch right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you ain't. Not, not gumbo my, from my son's scratch. mother, not <laughs> same age difference. You know, so, yeah. but so it was like, I'm like, you know, I said, I always, I always thought I wanted to be a husband until I realized what that entailed. Right. You know, and the fact that she moved across the country from California to Philadelphia to live in a one bedroom apartment with a guy she only met four times was a testament to the safety that I, she thought I could have provided. Hmm. Now we lasted probably nine months um, before we thought it was best to end it, but that was the most brilliant nine months because it showed me, it showed me everything I needed to work on in my manhood. It showed me hmm. what I was really asking for when I was right. praying for a wife. Like what did that really mean in real time, in real space? But it also, when I, uh, when I watched my uncle Clarence, you know, because two months after that relationship was over, uh, that's when his wife had passed, and I, I, I got to talking to him. I'm like, 70 years, man, like, y'all must have been through some shit. He was like, man, there were, the only thing we didn't do was leave. Mm. Wow. The only thing we didn't do was leave. And that, that, that I, now I understand the assignment because you're gonna get the richer and the and the poorer, you're gonna get the better and the worse, and then you know everybody's balloon is gonna get deflated a little Absolutely. bit, yeah. right? Yeah. And and I'm coming from a world where I've never cheated, so anytime I was in a relationship, it was fidelity, right? But it was short term, so you really can't right. you really can't right. wait that, right. right? So for me, it's like. I was only good while the times were good, and now I have a woman who actually has an attitude, right? And I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't, I didn't, I didn't know, and I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to this woman because in real life I was processing what real relationships look like. Right. Because I was just romance infatuation, and then once we realized that we're regular, uh, we we just go our separate right. ways, right? Mm. But it's like, wait a minute. It's like I have to listen. It's like I have to be around a woman who's not pleased with me, mm. that's a different sort of thing, <laughs> right? It's like, wait a minute, it's like, we're supposed to argue right now and right. you're still supposed to sleep here tonight? Right. That's crazy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, because because I, I spent the majority of my life with all of my interactions with women romantically were pleasurable. Right. We only saw each other when we wanted to see each other. Right. All of our interactions were, what do you mean it's been a month and we haven't had sex? Mm. What do you mean? <laughs> like how right. is that even a thing a month yeah. and it, but nothing could nothing is wrong but it's just you go through seasons where you know peaks and valleys and and now like it was so like I thank God for you know putting me in that position mm-hmm. um because it taught me so much right but having that plus my uncle Clarence uh lets me know that it's not about who comes it's about who never leaves right and that's the one thing I think I was missing is that is that part. And between mm-hmm. that relationship and my Uncle Clarence, man, we did everything but leave. But, that's beautiful. Um, we just had a moment, yeah. wait, the day before yesterday. She yeah, was standing well, actually, right there. The day before yesterday <laughs> was, and it was wasn't two resolved days. till yesterday. Yeah, it was so, two yeah. days. But you know, we just we uh got into it in our way. And like when we when we do uh argue we just got to the point maybe in the last four or five months where we've had a few arguments here and there's still not a lot whatsoever. And her being an emotional alchemist, me understanding my energy, we, we are very good at getting to the core of the issue, but it still don't feel good while you're in it. So yeah. that whole thing about I'm, I'm mad at you right now, but I know I got to come get my butt in this bed at right. the end of the day, right? Crazy. <laughs> right. Crazy. What, what, what we were able to realize was a huge part of, and I, I'm going to let, my wife talk about this in a second. I'm sure a lot of women can relate to what we was able to discover. But like you said, that mirror piece, every single time we've had a disagreement slash argument, whatever the logistics of the quote unquote beef was, when we work through it, there's always this little nugget 
that's showing me more about myself, yes. my understanding of life, the same for her and then the same for each other. Mm -hmm. So in this most recent conflict, when we was able to get to it, we was able to discuss there has been a theme of her almost trying to troubleshoot before I even know a problem exists because women have this ability to be able to put things together, to fix things. They see issues sometimes before the man even sees it and they try to protect us sometimes by staying quiet, yep. trying to keep the peace. So I've told her a few different times, yo, even if you feel like it's going to call, I just need that information yeah. to know how to assist the situation. So we got back to that and we got to the core of it. It was really about her expressing her fear of conflict. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things. This is the last thing we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. That conflict is actually healing. And in our very previous episode, she also talked about, you know, befriending anger. When you get in the position of being a practitioner, people think you're just supposed to be happy all the time. Anger Positive, is a very yeah. intelligent emotion that we're supposed to still gather from. But we can't get to those, quote unquote, low frequency emotions without going through that open door conflict. And everything you just said. We just experienced and yeah. got to the root of in the past couple of days. You want to add on, baby? Yeah. So, you know, it, it started by, like, my husband. So I just started writing a book, mm -hmm. which has caused me to be extremely tunnel vision and just consumed in that space. Yeah. Uh, to the point that a lot of other things were not being taken care of, like mm -hmm. my health. I wasn't taking care of my health. I wasn't eating. I wasn't drinking water. He would have to, like, remind me. And bring me water, like, remember to eat, remember to drink. And then it also got to the point of, you know, my husband and I were a great team. So when it when there's something that I'm lacking or maybe there's another area I'm performing well in, he'll perform well in the other area. And that looked like cleaning. And so he just brought it to my attention to just be more mindful and pay attention to detail when it comes to certain things. Yeah. So I attempted to now have the conversation now I'm like I've been wanting to talk about this <laughs> for a long time and I, I didn't know how to speak about it and so oh. you know my womanly thing is like okay I'm gonna put this system in place I'm gonna have this many pillows I'm gonna have you know <laughs> all of the spices put mm -hmm. in spice jars with, <laughs> with you know the labels on them <laughs> and the shampoo bottles right. you know and the amber glass because right. it's cute and it matches the aesthetic of the house you know all of the systems that I put in place to allow the house to flow in the way that I thought it, it would flow and make my husband feel at home. Mm -hmm. I've never oh. lived with anyone before. This is my first time. Sheesh. So um, my husband coming in, I'm like, okay, a wife is supposed to make their right. house feel like a home. And yes. I was really excited about that. And so um, I also did not discuss those things that I put in place with him. I just uh, put them in place and was like, this is going to work. And then, you know, the average person's like, I'm just trying to eat my food and season <laughs> it. I ain't know I was going to have to take the seasoning out of the seasoning and put it in another seasoning container because it got a label on it. Right. And so, you know, when the systems didn't happen, I was like, okay, you know, cool. I'm just going to do my best to um, adapt. But with that frustration came and then with that just not knowing how to – maneuver and being a wife making the house a home yeah. and not being overbearing not being controlling not looking like I'm about to tell him what to do not saying you need to put this here or this is this you need to add this here because that's the system I set in place yes. and so my thought process was I feel controlling I feel the frustration and I know that when I relay this message to him that is going to be the energy that's in it because that's what I feel. And so in my mind, I was like, I'm not going to say anything. You know, he done <laughs> told me many times, stop doing it. Right. I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to calm the storm within myself. Mm, that's deep. Five months later. Now he's like, I need you to be more mindful of cleaning up around the house. And my thought process was, I put all these systems in place, and, and now the house, yeah. now the house dirty, dirty as hell, <laughs> and it's not dirty. You know, our house yeah. is beautiful, but it's not up to par with right. what we like, because I didn't know how to say, babe, can you put the spices in the container without sounding or making him feel like I was trying to control him. Yes. I was too afraid to just 
state how I felt because I didn't want to make him feel uncomfortable. So in the process of me trying to make sure that didn't happen, it just happened five months later in more of an emotional way that wasn't necessary. So I still caused the storm. I just prolonged it and added more nuances to it. And it took us a minute to Mm -hmm. get to where this stood from. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, why is the conversation taking so many ebbs and flows? (laughs) You know, why is there so many nuances to this conversation? Love is patient. Love is kind. Yes. And I recognize that I, well, first of all, I'm a Libra. Okay, so oh it's, my ex is a Libra. Oh really? Yeah, girl, yes. Yes. So Libras are not well with conflict. We may be Hell well. No, she didn't even let me yell at her. <laughs> Listen, I couldn't raise my voice. Yes, and so conflict makes me feel very uncomfortable, and so I've. I'm an only child as well. Mm. So it was always just oh. me and my mom. Seeing your family beef a lot. Yeah, yeah. seeing my family fight a lot, and so. If I only if I had conflict with my mom, it's like okay, we are best friends, so we're gonna resolve that in a couple hours. Yeah. Anybody else I had conflict with, I would dismiss. Yeah, I yeah. would leave. I would run. I would block. I would ghost. Even in so the, now, I don't feel like an asshole because <laughs> it, it's a Libra thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it's a way to protect myself. It's a way to. It's like an unhealthy defense mechanism, so I can run from the uncomfortability of natural conversation. Right. And so oh, it man. took. Can we send her that part too? Well, we yeah. but I just mean. <laughs> I, I just did, yeah. So it, it took me a minute to get to the root of, even though it's just a conflict of like, just let's figure out a system to keep the house cleaner. That led to me having to acknowledge I'm not comfortable with conflict, which means I don't really know how to exist in conversation that doesn't make me feel comfortable without the knee jerk reaction of wanting to get my keys and leave. And Mm -hmm. so I didn't do that, but I also had to express, I think the reason why I overcompensate with not speaking my mind, not speaking my truth is because I'm already thinking about future moments that can lead to conflict. So I'm trying to like conflict resolve right then right. and there yes. and I'm I'm leaving my right. partner out of the situation. Yes. Right. I'm I'm robbing him of his opportunity to just hear me and yes. and possibly even be on board to so where right. there's no conflict at all and by me trying to resolve it within my own mind, I end up starting a war five years five months later. And that's similar to the grace muscle, the conflict muscle. That's something that has to be developed and I've had a lot more practice with that in previous relationships, living with people um, dealing with a lot of previous female partners that challenged me and vice versa in a lot of ways. But I had to get very good at being in an argumentative space. I had to be very good at even though my emotions is here, I'm still going to streamline my attention to get to, yeah, you said this, that, and the third, but this is the solution. This is what I had to do that all the time just to survive in relationships. I don't got to do that here, but my muscle to understand that conflict to a certain degree is natural. It can be unnecessary sometimes. But in life, it's natural. It's conflict, like I told her, happening inside our body. Cells is pushing other cells out of the way. Things is dying. Planets is colliding into, into each other. So conflict is necessary, but my muscle was probably a little bit more developed than when she said, like, this is a moment. She wasn't saying she was leaving. She was just recognizing that this is a moment that would have caused me to leave a situation. Right. So when you said that piece of what your uncle said, we did everything but Believe. leave. Believe. You got to make sure you with a person that's worthy of that and that's aligned with you to exist in that space. But once you do worthy have that, worthy. that's key. Once you do have that, these cookie cutter relationships and the vacations and the stuff that we see on social media, the meat of the relationship is the moment we just had the past couple of days. Y'all see us cook out yesterday and all of that type of stuff. And we'll talk about these um, moments where we have volatile um, exchanges, but that's where the meat of the love actually really happens. When it don't feel good, I don't feel like thinking of another way to say this to you because you're not getting it. I don't feel like holding these emotions, but this is what love really is about. I can't wait to find my person that I can argue with. Mm, mm, fire. <laughs> which is which is a total. Oh shucks. Mm-hmm. You popping out here in these streets. It's all good. You know, it's that's that's podcast one on one. It's put your phone. <laughs> it's all good. Are you okay? This ain't the normal podcast. This is just you home. know. This but just um, home. you know, I mean, I always ran from that. Like when, you know, 
I didn't I did I don't like confusion. Right. I was I was I was raised in a tad bit of it and then I went from that to a structure of su- supreme discipline and order being in the military. So I gravitated more towards that. And then you know, I, I used to shy away from arguments. It's like, uh oh, once we get to that arguing phase of a of a bond it's probably time for us to go because right. I, it was my belief that our spirits were, weren't aligning anymore right. or the wax kind of dull mm-hmm. on this pretty car. Um, so I chose that. I, I used that opportunity to leave because uh, one of the biggest things I suffer with is the fact that I can still talk about being a single guy. Like I haven't already loved so many women and the fact that I'm still single and I'm not married to one of them is it automatically is a disrespect or a slight right. to all of the women that I used to love, right. which it was not. And I, I want to make it perfectly clear every time that I speak about that, uh, the reason why I'm not married is has nothing to do with any of the women that I could have dealt with. I think they're I think that they were all beautiful. I think that they were all worthy of love and a husband. I just did not show up to be that for them. Mm. And then I was, I, you know, I struggled, bro, because um, when, we, when we go back to the Christmas list, I always thought like, you know, like wife and child was number one, hmm. right? And then I got all these other blessings and I'm waiting for that. And then I realized that, hey, just because you want something for your life does not necessarily mean God wants it for your right. life as well. So there could be a scenario where if my life is already written out, there might not ever be a wife. Right. So will you ever be, will you ever give yourself supreme grace in that way mm. to say, hey, will your life be successful? Hmm. I mean, will you will you see yourself as, as a successful man in your own eyes behind closed doors? Because, you know, you got a room full of trophies and accomplishments, but not the one thing, right? And then I had to ask myself, like, you know, I try, I try to understand my path with how I've dealt with women, right? And I had to ask myself, like, yo, like, what if I'm just a rest stop on a woman's road to recovery, right? Mm. Like, what if I'm just, you know, what if mm. I'm not, what if I'm not meant? Because every woman I've ever loved, I love them hard. Right. I love them effortlessly, and I love them un- until I didn't, right. which, which for some people is 70 years, for like my Uncle Clarence, for some people is 17 months, but it was all love, right. all genuine, all loyal, all the time. And then one day it wasn't, you know, just like with my Uncle Clarence, same way. So then I'm like, well, maybe I'm just meant to ex- have help women experience love in a real authentic way to maybe set the table for the future but I'm just I'm just a rest stop on Route 10. That Ryan Reynolds movie, right? I think that was Ryan Reynolds. He had that movie where he would have sex with him and then they would get married right after him. Mm-hmm. It's similar to what you're but saying. But see, it's not always sex. No, like, I know, I know. I was just well, kind of no, referencing it. I mean, it. Well, now, see, this is so beautiful to me because there's a lot of women that I've loved and I've just not slept with. Right. And I think, I think a lot of them in the meantime were so angry. Like, you have never... I have never mm. seen so many women upset that I did not want to sleep with right. them sexually. And um, they took it, like sometimes I would have to sleep with them because they would, uh, I would see how if I didn't, if I didn't educate them correctly, uh, they would see that as a sign, like a slight, or they would internalize that for like a lack of value on their part. Right. Because I, but I just like, I don't want to be another body for you, right? You know, and I don't, and I don't want our, I don't want our foundation to be super fleshy, you know. So, I don't mean to go off nah, off subject good. a little bit, but like I'm trying to put all of these things together because I, I believe a man's manhood gets recalibrated on a daily, mm-hmm. right? And you know, you you got to kind of, you got to kind of take inventory in real time, just on your on your ascension. So now we got all of these moving parts. Like, all right. Am I not gonna have a wife at all? Am I gonna have these micro wives where it's you know, <laughs> or am I gonna? Is it gonna? Am I only gonna be with people until it's peaceful and then leave? Or do I do I want that seventy years? Do I want that everything but leave? Do mm. I want that that opportunity? You know, I think I think for me, I think I want I want that. I think I want. Well, I know if I if I was to be in a thing. It's that two become one 
And then, it, you know, you can't separate that. Like once you, once you put two eggs in a bowl and you put the whisk to them mm -hmm. and you they're one, yeah. you can't un, you can't un. So I, so I'm just praying, dear God, I, I, I know we don't talk a lot. You know, you want me to put out a new book. I want a baby. Um, but here a I daughter am. specifically. <laughs> well, I, I would love, I just want a healthy baby. Yeah, no doubt. I but I know you talk a lot about, but about, I, about I, daughter. Yeah. Uh, people see me, uh, I wear a lot of brooches and they automatically think this is my attempt at fashion. It's like, no, uh, mm. I, I want to collect them for my daughter because mm. maybe 20 years from now, she's going to have this connection of fire, Chanel, Gucci, YSL brooches. And it'll be like, you know, I've been preparing a place for you in my heart and I've been thinking of you like I've already got an escrow for my wedding bro this is how crazy it is because mm. I just want to have the you know and I, I try to give myself little rewards along yeah. the way it's like you know because I'm not a husband now doesn't mean I need to not do the husband work right so when you ask me why all of these pivots are successful because what if I don't get married until I'm 40 right at least now me and my wife don't have to work because right. I did all of the work for us before you even got here, babe. Now, you guys are teaching me that the work is beyond what I do in the financial sphere. It's also the grace. Right. I need to have the grace included because I don't want my wife to come in pouring. Right. Because I wanna, right. I wanna be full already. And that's something that I can take from this is because, you know, uh, I thought my manhood was, hmm perpetuated by my ability to acquire assets, capital, you know, anything fiduciary. And then uh, second to that was God, mm. you know, you know, because what good is a, a man that knows God, but still poor. And that was, that was my young mind. And then I kind of switched that hierarchy up because once you know God, you're forever protected, right. you're forever covered. Um, but now that, now that I have those two things, um, maybe that, maybe that missing link to my destination is the grace. And this would be the, uh, probably the last thing I say, but like just man to man, brother yes. to brother. I remember being in that exact same space and just working with myself and again with so many men, that hierarchy, low key, even beyond fiduciary fatherhood and husbandhood is like the two most powerful programs of what we identify ourselves. Once we get to a certain point, you you know, soldier, royal oats and all of that, you get to that point where it's like, I need a wife, I need to be a father, right? Yes. I was extremely heavy into that when I started my, my healing process intentionally. And again, covering from, recovering from being blind, kidney disease, no job, disability. And the main thing I kept thinking about was my first desire before I wanted to be a rapper, before I wanted to be Darius Lovehall, athlete, all these different things, was watching my father. Yes. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I was the only kid in my community that had my father. My dad was everybody's dad. I got yeah. two parents in the household. They called us the Huxicles. I still found my time in the streets because I felt like I needed to do that as a rite of passage on some, some stupidness, yes. right? But my first desire was want to want to be like my dad. And when I started to do this healing and this came back up, that was like a burning desire in my soul. Like, I feel like I'm not going to be complete until I have this. Yes. My son comes. I remember seeing his ultrasound for the first time. I break down in the whole office. Like, all the women coming out there, oh, and I'm, I'm gone because it's yeah. like, yo, my child is actually on the way. And now having my wife, I have those two things that I felt was missing pieces to my soul. And I realize as beautiful as they are, as necessary as they are for my human experience, yes. they still not it. No. They still feel equally as good as some of those moments when I was in the forest looking like um, Najee Ramba Martin, yeah. right? Trying to get myself in order and, and the sun rays just beaming on my skin and I'm in silence and I'm enjoying my own peace. They feel equal. But yes. until you get it, it's like, no, I got to put these two things into the wallet before I can just say, all right, I'm good. Yes. Nothing in this world is going to be it. So even when no. you get your beautiful wife, even when you get your beautiful daughter, it's going to be a... a a beautiful ride to enjoy. But at the end of the day, you already doing God's work until the physical wife and physical child shows up is that. It's just our minds kind of almost trick us out of it and think we need to carry it at the end of the string. You are already that. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I received that. Yes. Yep.
Thank you so much for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. I feel so much My better, brother. man. Yes. I feel and so much better. Thank you man. for sharing like as as transparently as you have. And I know our listeners are gonna have a beautiful time listening Word. to this podcast. We might have to podcast. cut this into two parts. Word, right. <laughs> <laughs> this might actually be Let's see how long did we go? Oh, we're right at two hours. Oh no, we good. Yeah, we've we're done good. 150 before. Yeah. 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 So they still watch. That's perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so. oh yeah, so four yeah. books out. Four just books just out. words, one and two. Yes. Was the first two. Then yes. it was the boyfriend book. Well no, Dear Woman first. Okay. Dear Woman was first. Yeah, well no, no, Dear Woman was before the boyfriend book. Okay, I got you. Yes. And then the boyfriend book. And then the boyfriend book. And hope is on the way. And where can they get these? Uh just like the poll dot com is the best place to get them, but they're available everywhere. And then you also mentioned that you are planning to get back into the touring arena. Right? Yes, yes. I um I got one more one more pivot to uh hit my Euro step on. <laughs> but um yeah after that like uh yeah, it's on and popping. Okay. <laughs> it's on and popping. And, 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 and about like what about like other social media platforms? Like if they want to get in contact with you or just hear more of everything that you have to share, list all the places they can find you. You know, I, I'm going to find you. Mm. I don't even want you to come mm. over to my house yet because it's not clean. <laughs> uh, but you'll, you'll, uh, I'll find you when I want to be found. Right. When I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, like, I don't, I don't really need you to, I haven't posted on my Instagram yeah, I know this, in like yeah. 12 days. But that's because I only want to post when I want to post, right. you know. Um, so my house is a mess, but it's a mess because we're expanding. We're under mm-hmm. construction, not a mess because I'm living in filth, right? But I just you don't want to you don't want to invite people over while you right. got snacks. But in the meantime, <laughs> just pray for me, right? Just pray for me and remember, just Mike the poet, right? And then once you see me, you'll see me. And um, one last thing as far as your business, dope. Yes, I, I saw at a certain point you talked about. Incarcerated, incarcerated brothers that yes. want to write novels. You, yes. you kind of at that point you were saying you needed people to kind of almost transcribe their written books. Yes, is that still a need? Or is there any other capacity people could get with you where you can employ them? Y'all can work together to help your platform as far as dope. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, dope stands for Dreams on Paper Entertainment Publishing. Um, we're a, uh, a not-for-profit publishing publishing company. We don't take any rights or royalties, uh, and we we foster self-publishing. We're not a, a book publisher in a traditional sense. Um, it's it's probably one of the most beautiful things that I've built because it gives people the opportunity to turn their own personal pain or passion mm. uh, into purpose. Um, so you can you can visit the website dopepublishing.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got our president, who's actually from. Uh, Houston, well, she's from Wisconsin, but she lives in Houston, Melanie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're looking for all, I mean, if you need a job as a creative writer, as a copy editor, as a designer, uh, you know, anything, anything in that book publishing space, we got jobs for you. No. If you want to volunteer, I've got hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of black and brown men and women who are behind the walls who need assistance with uh, helping their books get published. Um, so if you want to be a vessel for that, then please tap in with us that way at dopepublishing.com. You won't, don't use it as a way to talk to me because I don't really man them phones. I'm so proud of this business because it's one that stands on its own Mm -hmm. without my own personal, uh, energy towards it. So I love that about the business. Hey, if you just need a new place to publish your book or if you need a new place to, uh, print your books, uh, we do offer printing to, um, some of the best prices in the nation. Uh, and it's all small business. We don't, you know, hit up Lulu or somebody else to print it. So, I mean, yeah, just uh, dopepublishing.com. Just check the website out. We got over 200 books from all uh, minority authors, some incarcerated cats. Just go over there and buy a book from somebody else. Mm-hmm. We got kids' books, novels, poetry books, et cetera, man. Uh, shout out to Dope Publishing. It's been, uh, it's been seven years mm. since we started that. Beautiful, beautiful. So just yeah. thank you for your presence. Oh, man. Yeah, humility. We, me. we met you one time. I asked you, like, yeah, I do it. No problem. I'm coming through. Yes. Booked an even earlier flight just to honor the time that we had set. So I just appreciate how you approach your um, your business, but more so just your, your vesselness. Yes. Because I, I feel the most thing, the most resonance I get from you is the fact that you are really intentional mm-hmm. about remaining, remaining as pure of a vessel of God that you can. And there's nothing above that. Somebody could have all the money in the world, accolades. That's what I put above everything. So just thank you for being who you are, bro. 
Oh, I appreciate yeah, you. Absolutely. Keep, keep me in prayer. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, prayer. y'all. All right. We will see y'all in the next episode. Yes. Love and light. Perfect. Hey, yes. <laughs> My bro. That was good. My bro, that was beautiful, bro. Jeez.